do. Nothing was really wrong with the guardian the court appointed to Jancy, but nothing was all that right about her either. She was what his mother might have called the lukewarm, neither one thing nor the other. But for Jancy that was all right. He could survive with someone like that. He could get by. For once in his life he didn't have to worry about where his meals were going to come from. He threw himself into his schoolwork and was surprised to find that he enjoyed it, that he even excelled at it. The sort of kids who before had given him a wide berth now began to circle closer, sometimes even speaking to him. One of them, a kid named Henry Wandre, started hanging out around him, silently standing a few feet away from him during breaks between classes, sitting across from him at lunch, but at first without speaking or meeting his eye. Sometimes he shadowed Jency for a few blocks when he walked home. At first Jency tolerated it, then he got used to it, and then he started to like it. He started to notice when Henry wasn't there, like his shadow or his ghost. What? Jency finally said one day at lunch. Nothing, said Henry, and then they sat silently for a while until Henry asked, what music do you like? Music? wondered Jency. What did he know about music? Helplessly he just shrugged. What about you? Henry rattled off a few names of bands, then when Jency didn't say anything in reply, began to try to explain what each one sounded like. He was, as it turned out, quite good at it. Capable of talking in a lively and surprising way that didn't really describe the music so much as say something slantwise that still gave a sense of what it sounded like. Jency was surprised to find that he enjoyed listening to him talk. Henry, silent for so long, now seemed unable to be quiet. And later, when he gave Jency the music to listen to, Jency found that the descriptions felt right. Henry was his first real friend, apart from his brother. But you couldn't really think of a brother as a friend, could you? How had he gotten to be fifteen before having a real friend? Thinking that made him resent this one, which made him feel guilty. Here he was, living an okay life, with a decent guardian and one real friend, while his brother was wandering alone somewhere out there in the domes. He had glimpsed his brother once or twice, usually from far away, though once up close. That time, his brother had seemed not to know him. Istvan had not acknowledged him as he went past, and though Jency wanted to reach out and speak to him, he hadn't been able to bring himself to do so. He couldn't. Not if Istvan wasn't going to meet him halfway. But later he wondered if his brother hadn't simply been lost in his private world of patterns and numbers. Maybe his brother was so deep within his own head that he couldn't see Jency. His life was like that in those days. It was like he was on a teeter-totter, slipping from feeling all right to feeling guilty and then back again, but never stabilizing. After a few months, he trusted Henry enough to tell him about Istvan. That's your brother? said Henry. He'd seen Istvan here and there, always from a distance, and didn't quite know what to think of him. I feel like I should help him, said Jency. Henry nodded. Sure, he said. He's your brother. You have to feel that way. And then he shrugged. But what can you do? he asked. For six months he did nothing really, and then one day, walking home, he was talking with Henry about the apartment building he used to live in trying to describe it as vividly as Henry had managed to describe not only music, but other things since, and finding himself failing to make it come alive. Henry was watching him politely, eagerly even, but he kept tripping and stumbling over his words, unable to make them into images that Henry could understand. Slowly he ground to a stop. Henry watched and waited for him to continue, and when he didn't, simply said, you could just show it to me. Jency thought, why not? 
so they trekked a mile or so over to the valve that led to the Mariner Valley compound. The valve operator stationed there stared at them quizzically. You sure you want to go in there? Two nice kids like you? He asked from beneath a bristling mustache. It's a little rough. I used to live there, said Jensi. The operator wrinkled his nose. If I'd lived there and gotten out, I don't know if I'd be that eager to go back. But he let them through anyway. They watched the valve twist close behind them, and then walked the thirty meters down the tube to the second valve. By the time they got there, Genzi was beginning to have his doubts. He had a new life now. He should be moving on. Why would he want to show any of this to Henry? The valve twisted open and they stepped out. To Genzi, the compound on the other side looked so familiar, just as he remembered it, but different too. Having changed himself, he could see it for what it was, a slum. The valves were a way of cutting off the Mariner Valley compound in case the people inside decided to revolt. The streets that seemed normal to him as a child, he could now compare to the streets where he currently lived. Everything was run down, a little filthy, a little pathetic. You lived here? asked Henry. Jensi shrugged. For a moment he considered turning around, going back to the valve and leaving, but then Henry asked, So, where's your building? He showed Henry the worn concrete steps, the cracked floor of the hallway leading down to their apartment, and then the door itself, discolored and scraped ragged along one side. They stared at it. Jensi didn't know what else to do and Henry didn't seem ready to go back yet. The door was sealed where it met the frame with police tape. Why? wondered Jensi. He was surprised that someone new hadn't moved in by now. But looking more closely, he realized that the tape had been slit very carefully, so at the first glance the door still looked like it was sealed. Henry must have realized this as well, for he reached out and placed his hand on the door's handle and pushed down. The door was not locked. As both boys watched, it slid slowly open. Behind it was the largely empty living room, floor coated now with a thin layer of dust. There was an uneven couch, the small vid screen with its cracked corner, the makeshift coffee table made from a discarded and bent shipping container that they'd found and then beaten back flat. The wall was discolored, now beginning to gray, with mold in its corners, unless it was just dust gathering there. We probably shouldn't be here, said Jensi. The memories in the room were palpable to him, most of them bad. It's okay, said Henry, already poking around. There's no one here. Even if someone comes, we can talk our way out of it. For Henry, Jensi realized, it was a game, and then Jensi noted a path that they had scuffed through the dust from the front door to the entrance to the back bedroom, the room he and Istvan had shared. He followed the path with his eyes. He could see a light coming from the crack under the bedroom door. He reached out and grabbed Henry's arm. What? asked Henry, starting to shake free. Quiet, whispered Jensi. I think someone's here. If he'd only turned and left, things might have been different. But he didn't. Why? Perhaps it was because Henry was there with him, and that, for Henry, this was still an adventure. Knowing someone was there made it even more of an adventure for Henry. It was simply an escalation of the violation that had begun when they found the police tape slid over the door. They were sneaking in, and now they were risking something. But from Henry's perspective, probably the worst that could happen was that they might get scolded or kicked out. Or maybe, at very worst, turned into the authorities for trespassing and then released with a reprimand. But Jensi had grown up in this neighborhood. He knew it could get much worse, that if the wrong person was in the back room, they might end up badly hurt or even dead. 
And so, when Henry started moving forward, deeper into the apartment, Jensi was not quick to follow. He watched his friend go, his feet tracking a new path through the dust, until he stood beside the bedroom door. Maybe, thought Jensi, there would be nobody there. Maybe someone had come and gone, but left the light on. But as Henry reached out and touched the door's handle, Jensi knew that he was fooling himself. And indeed, before Henry could open it, the door opened of its own accord, and a blotchy arm reached out and jerked him through. Jensi started for the outer door, already beginning to turn. But there was nowhere to run, nobody to tell until he had gone through the valve and into the larger city. By then it would be too late. Henry would either be dead or lying broken on the floor when he got back, or he would have been carried away and would be gone. And so, barely out the door, his feet slowed, he stopped, and he turned back. He was big enough, he told himself, and tough too, and he had grown up here and knew how to fight. If he could just get a jump on whoever it was, there might be a chance for both him and Henry to get away. He quietly approached the door to the bedroom and carefully pushed the handle down until the tongue slid out of the lock's groove. He could hear a voice inside, whispering and insistent. Taking a deep breath, he threw the door open and rushed in, fist already cocked and ready to strike. On the floor, kneeling on top of Henry, holding him down, keeping him from struggling, hand clamped over his mouth, was a filthy man. His hair and skin were wretched and stinking. Who sent you? He heard him whispering loudly, without lifting his hand from Henry's mouth to let him answer. What do they want from me? Why are they after me? And then Jensi was on the man, clipping him in the ear and knocking him enough askew that he turned and shifted his balance, and Henry began to wriggle free. But at the same moment the man turned, and Jensi was surprised to find that his face was one he recognized. It was Istvan. But though he recognized Istvan, his brother didn't recognize him. His eyes were glazed, crazed even, and as he half fell, half clambered off Henry, it seemed almost like his brother wasn't there at all. It was like it was just his body, but with someone else, or even something else in charge. Henry had managed to scramble to his feet. Istvan, stumbling, gathered his balance against the wall, and then bared his teeth. Istvan, said Jensi, it's me. Istvan made a noise that was a kind of a snarl, his eyes darting everywhere, looking perhaps for some hidden pattern, but as a result, unable to see what was in front of him, and then he ducked his head and charged. He struck Jensi hard, right in the center of the chest, knocking him off his feet, coming down hard on top of him. For a moment, Jensi had the awful feeling of suffocation, the room fading around him, and then he managed to suck in a deep, pain-racked breath. Istvan was on top of him, striking out, pummeling his shoulders and neck and face with fists. Henry was behind him, trying and failing to duck him off. Istvan, he tried to say again. It's me, Jensi. But nothing came out. He tried to grab Istvan's hands, but failed. He tried to protect his face with his forearms, but Istvan kept punching him the blows glancing off his arms, but sometimes getting through, with Jensi catching here and there a glimpse of his slack, troubled face. There was a moment when he thought he was about to fade from consciousness, and then it passed and his mind suddenly felt sharper, but also more distanced, as if he were observing himself from the outside. He suddenly realized that Istvan might very well kill him, Istvan had been searching for something for a while, though he was never quite sure what. It was often like that, aimless, but he knew if he searched long enough, it would eventually nudge its way out from the world it resided in, the world that was real, and come find him. Before, when his brother had been there, there had been things to pull him out, to interrupt his search, so that only rarely could he wait long enough for the surface of the world to peel back but now he had all the time in the world. 
The first thing was to limit the world itself, to get rid of all unnecessary distractions, of anything and everything that did not encourage an arrangement that would crack the world open. Being out in the dome proved too much. There were signs and symbols there, patterns of all kinds, but they drew him in all directions at once. There were people there, too, who shook him and disturbed him and would not let him stay put. A pattern, an arrangement, out in the dome had led him back to his mother's apartment again, just as a pattern, an arrangement, in the apartment had first coaxed him out into the dome. A voice had come to him and told him to slit back the tape sealing the door and told him too where his mother had hidden the key that would let him in. It was a voice that was not attached to a body, or if it was, he couldn't find the body. It was a voice that somehow was inside of him, but separate from him too. He had left the pantry as it was. The pattern was good there. It had been made whole when he had left, though it was not complete in and of itself. He had arranged the couch just right. The coffee table he had left as it was, but he had used his fist to dent it further until his fist was bloody, and then had stared at his distorted grey reflection in its surface. There, he thought, the shadow man, and waited for him to come out. Only he didn't come out. If it was the shadow man, he could not be sure if it was or was not, not yet, not until he came out. Maybe he was too grey, and was another man entirely. Or maybe it was nothing at all. And so, sitting on the couch, he had waited for hours, sometimes bringing his face down close to the metal surface, but still unable to coax the shadow man forth. But after a time he had felt a pattern pushing at him. The pattern was right, but he was the one who was out of place. No, he had to be elsewhere for the pattern to do its work. So he had stood and stepped his way across the room, and into the room that he and his brother had once occupied. There, in the bare room, he waited. When it came, it would come now to find him. He stared at the door, patient, ready for whatever would come. How long he waited, how many hours or days, he couldn't say. But in the end there came footsteps outside, and he knew the moment had arrived. He stood and pressed his ear to the door. And then, when the footsteps approached, he yanked the door open and grabbed what was on the other side and pulled it in. But no, it was not what he was hoping for, not what he expected. It was not something from the other world, but something from this world, an invader, an intruder, someone who had come to disrupt the pattern and to keep him from succeeding. Who had sent him? There were forces, he knew, out to disrupt him, forces that meant to keep him from finding what he was meant to find and fulfilling his purpose. They had been there at all moments, disturbing him. He shook this one, letting him know what he thought of him. To get him to tell him who was after him, who was trying to ruin him, he kept shaking, kept shaking. Yes, he told himself, he would get somewhere, he was getting somewhere and then something struck him hard in the head, dazing him. The invader beneath him wriggled out from under him and away, and there were, he saw, at least two invaders now in the room. He scrambled up and away to face them, trying at the same time not to see them too closely, not to lose sight of the pattern, for if he lost sight of the pattern, then they would win. But there at last was the shadow man, curling there in the air, splying from the feet of one of the intruders, the one who had struck him. The way to him was through the body of the intruder, he knew. He shook his head, and then struck out, and the intruder was beneath him, and the shadow man was beneath both of them, being held by the intruder. But if he tried to dig his way through him, then maybe he could get to him. The intruder was trying to speak, but no, he could hear a voice within his head telling him not to listen and the other intruder was behind him now, striking him, but he was ready for that this time, he could keep his balance. It had happened, he had seen what he wanted, 
what he needed, and there would be no stopping him now. 3. There were nine of them gathered at a table. Some of them were clearly scientists, others military, others bureaucrats. Still others, it was hard to say exactly what they were. Most, but not all of them, were unitologists, and here, among friends, they all wore their amulets exposed and hanging around their necks, publicly professing their creed. So, we're in agreement, said one of them. He was a military man and seemingly the leader of an impressive bearing named Blackwell. Of very high rank, his uniform studded with insignia and commendations. I still think it's too dangerous, said another, a wiry little man, a scientist named Kurzweil. Despite all precautions, the black marker experiments went quickly out of control. We lost the majority of our team. We're very lucky that there wasn't an outbreak, that we were able to stop it within the walls of the compound. He gestured to the scientist next to him. Hayes can attest to that. And yet I'm for it, said Hayes. As is everyone here but you, Kurtzvale. In any experiment there is risk, and the potential gains that we have from unlocking the power of the black marker far outweighs the risks. We are the vanguard meant to lead humanity to convergence. Now that we recover the data, we should have the means to build a new marker. Some of the others nodded in agreement. Fine, said Blackwell. He turned to the first scientist. You're outvoted, Kurtzvale, as you knew already. Kurtzvale shrugged. Can we at least agree not to build a new facility on Earth? We need to be somewhere where, if there is an outbreak, it'll do minimal damage. So, where do we go now? asked Blackwell. To the moon? suggested one of the men. Kurtzvale shook his head. Too close, not private enough. We need to go somewhere where we can allow things to develop and see how they go, get as much data as possible, and then nuke the planet if needs be said one of the men whose profession wasn't identifiable. His hair was cut short and he had cruel eyes. His skin had a dullness to it, was almost grey. Somewhere off the beaten track. Blackwell nodded. I'll send a ship out, he said. I know just a man for the job. We'll see what we can find. They stood and prepared to go, but the two men without identifiable profession or affiliation beckoned to Blackwell to stay behind. He did, remaining silent with his arms folded, waiting until the three of them were alone in the room. But even once everyone else was gone, the men didn't say anything. That went quite well, I think, Blackwell finally said. Who do you have for the job? asked the larger of the two ignoring Blackwell's comment. Who? Commander Grotter. We've used him in the past. He has impeccable credentials and is very discreet, as is his crew. The other man nodded. We'll want to meet him, he said. You've never asked to meet them before, said Blackwell. This is much too important than anything we've done before. Don't you trust me? asked Blackwell. The two men just stared at him, as if he hadn't asked the question. We'll want to meet him, the man repeated. Blackwell nodded. Of course, he said. 